Good afternoon. It's time once again for the St. Mark Spark, the Tuesday edition. It is a joy to be with you all here again. We're going to jump right into our reading. It is kind of lengthy. It's nine verses, but it's filled with a lot of rich things to chew on, to dwell into, to try to live out. So starting from Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26, listen now as God speaks to us through God's word. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level plain with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed all of them. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Luke chapter 6 is not as commonly referred to, not as well known as Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, it is what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's where we get the Beatitudes. You might have heard echoes of the Beatitudes in Luke 6 today. Where Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount, Luke chapter 6 has what is called the Sermon on the Plains. It's the same, but different. Much like a week ago, it was snowing, and today it's going to be 90 degrees. It's still April. It's still the same season, and yet it's a lot different. It's important to see the similarities of what we hear in Luke 6, comparing it to Matthew 5, but also important is the differences. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, it, it talks about uh, blessed are are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. It goes through all the blessings and also what is going they're going to receive. In some ways, Luke chapter 6, uh, it does that, but it just says, this is, it's shorter. It says, blessed are you, for instance, blessed are you who are poor. Not the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are poor. Poor. It's very descriptive in being more narrow. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And the next short one is blessed are you who hungry, hung, who are hungry now. Not who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That can be implied right there. But it could be simply enough to say blessed are you when you have no money, when you are poor, when you're destitute. Blessed are you when you're hungry when you, you can hear your stomach growling and you know there is nothing to feed you or maybe nothing to feed your family, nothing to feed your loved ones. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Again, it's similar to Matthew 5, but it's different. When you say, blessed are you who weep now, the question is, for what are you weeping? Are you weeping tears of, of sorrow? Are you weeping tears of longing? Are you weeping tears of 
dismay? Are you weeping tears of abandonment or betrayal or denial? Frederick Beatner says, pay attention to your tears. Pay attention to the tears that come out of your eyes. Because in those tears, your spirit is speaking. In those tears, the corpus of who you are is expressing itself. So listen to your tears. Listen to those things that are causing you to weep. And pay attention because they tell you for what you are weeping or for whom you are weeping. And Jesus says, blessed are you who weep now. Maybe you're weeping for the world. Maybe you're weeping about gun violence and, and the senselessness of it. Maybe you're weeping for lost relationships over the past year, either through the pandemic or just because so many people have siloed up and gone to their own camps and you and you recognize you don't have the same relationships with, with some people who have maybe cut you off or, or maybe you've had to distance yourself. Pay attention to that sadness and that weeping. But Jesus says even more than that, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And then Jesus, and this is actually very similar to what we hear, have in Matthew 5 and Luke 6, uh, verse uh, 22. He says, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what the religious people, that is for what the, the holier than thou people, the holy rollers did, the ancestors did to the prophets long ago. There's a lot to learn in this part of the passage as well. Because blessed are people when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, or when they defame you on account of the Son of Man. Sometimes I think Christians lose that last part on account of the Son of Man. Because if there is a, in an offense culture, and we have what is known right now as an offending culture, an offense culture, everybody takes offense at so many other things. And the worst offenders, frankly, in my opinion, are Christians. They're, they're folks who go to church on Sunday. They're folks who carry their Bibles. They're folks who do devotions and even do good work. But the idea of so many people is that Christians are being persecuted in our country. And friends, that's simply not true. Just because the world changes, just because culture changes, just because their other people are allowed certain rights doesn't mean that somehow we have lost our rights. Just because in many ways we can't hold on to, to previous prejudices or previous, previous positions of privilege and power doesn't mean that that naturally means that we're being persecuted. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The goal is not to build the church. The goal is to build the kingdom, or some people will call this the kingdom of Christ. The goal is to make the world more just, to make the world more equitable. The thing is that the church oftentimes has fought that tooth and nail of any kind of change, of any kind of progress, or any kind of inclusion. And then when they fight that and, and people push back, they call it persecution. But friends, it's not. It's not persecution. So when we hear the phrase, blessed are people, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and when they revile and defame you on account of the Son of Man, it has to be on the account of the Son of Man. If people hate us, if they exclude us, if they revile us because we are being hateful or we are being exclusive or we are reviling others, this is not a blessing from God. In fact, it is much more of a challenge to convict us to change, to look at our lives. But on the other hand, if we are standing up for the Son of Man, which means we are standing up for those who are hungry now, we're standing up for the poor now, we're standing up for those who weep now. When we stand up for those, we're told <coughs> in Matthew that uh, we are really standing up for Jesus because when those who are hungry, we feed them, we're feeding Jesus. And when we give them a drink of water, we're really giving a drink to Jesus. When we visit people who are imprisoned, we're really visiting Jesus. When we are clothing the naked, we're really clothing Jesus. When we're doing the work of the kingdom, we are doing those things for Jesus. 
And yes, if we do that with our whole hearts and our souls, yes, if we do that wholly and completely, there will be pushback because we will not be trying to maintain the status quo. In fact, we will be trying to challenge the status quo, God willing, to making sure that bellies are full, to making sure that those who are poor have enough, to making sure that those who are weeping are comforted. If we're doing that in Jesus, we can rejoice and be glad in that day. We can say, we can leap for joy because we know our reward is not this side of eternity. Our reward is in heaven. Our reward is in heaven. We leap for joy today because our reward's in heaven, but also because we get glimpses of heaven right here and right now when we take care of brothers, sisters, and siblings. Now, the difference, the last difference that I'm going to focus on between Matthew 5 and Luke chapter 6, we talked about the mountains and the plains. We talked about uh, how Luke 6 is much shorter to much more concise, but also the, the part about Luke 6 that's different where Matthew 5 is just about the blessings. Luke 6 is also about the woes and the challenges. So if the blessings at the beginning are to those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who weep, the woe we have to listen to as well. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now that's a challenge. And I might not look at myself as wealthy, but if I I go online and I go to my wealth calculator, I will see that I'm in the top 95, 96, 97% of wealthy people in the world, it's easy to look out at other people in, in our own neighborhoods who have more than us and, and think of us, ourselves somehow lacking. But we don't look at, at those who have less and realize how much we actually do have and how rich we are. The question what we do with our richness and what we do with these things, is that our goal? Is that our God? Jesus says, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now. For you will be hungry because we are filled with the things that do not last. Those empty calories of the world. We are filled with what I call the cotton candy. Those things that that look big, but they provide no nourishment. Woe to you who are full down with all the things that don't feed. Because in the end, you will be hungry. And woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. That is perhaps the hardest thing. It doesn't mean that that we're not supposed to laugh. We're not supposed to rejoice. In fact, the, the Bible says quite the opposite. We rejoice and we laugh with friends. We, we, we laugh together. And, and sometimes we laugh instead of crying. But when you are laughing at someone else's expense, when you are laughing at someone else's poverty or somebody else's need or, or somebody else's dire circumstances, then that is the woe there. Because if you're laughing now, you will mourn and weep. This is, again, a reminder that we hear throughout the four Gospels about God's preferential option for the poor. So woe if you laugh now and and, and laughing covers up real change or substantive change in your life in the world, for you will mourn and weep. And the last part is, woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what the ancestors did to the false prophets. And this is, frankly, a a challenge to any preacher, any person who chooses or or is called to fill the pulpit. You know, if all we ever get in our sermons is amens, if all we ever get is a pat on the back or a tussle of the hair and say, do better next time, then that's not really preaching. Preaching at its core, we're told it is to comfort the afflicted, but it's also to afflict the comfortable. And you'll see that every sermon either has something that is a challenge or is a comfort. A couple of weeks ago, MP, Pastor MP preached something that was really about comforting, about afflicting the comfortable. And my sermon this last week about the Good Shepherd was about comforting the afflicted. The question is that if we're never challenged, if all we are ever have is people speaking well of us and the pastoral role, we're not doing our job because part of the pastoral role is the prophetic role as well. And it's the challenge is to grow and to change. And those will always involve some level of pain as well. So this is good news, good news on the mountaintop. But this is also good news on the plains. It is good news at all points in our lives. 
So may you pay attention to these blessings, but also to the woes as well. It may, as we talk about on Sunday, God being the true vine, may the, the gardener, the divine gardener who, who, who spun the whirling planets into action, who, who walked with, with Adam in, in the stillness of that first garden in Eden, may the gardener prune in you and prune in me and prune in us anything that does not bear this kind of fruit. And may you find in that your blessing. May you find in that God being with you. And may you find in that the true vine. May God be with you all.